Welcome back to another episode of The Circuit. I am Roger Schumann, and today I'm very fortunate to be uh, with my friend, Steve Johns. Steve, welcome to The Circuit. Thanks, Roger. Good to be here. So uh, first off, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, you're listening to this pod this podcast with one cause. Steve, can, can you describe it at a high level, what the company does and the, cu the customers that you serve? Uh, absolutely. So let's start with our vision or our why. And I'll, I'll say that that's to help build better tomorrows. And I know that sounds pretty broad based, but how we're doing that is by providing digital fundraising solutions to nonprofits. And we help them maximize fundraising results by supporting auctions and galas and dinners and golf outings, runs and walks and rides. And so a lot of event fundraising, but also online fundraising. And so uh, our customers are about 5,000 nonprofits across the country, representing causes like fighting disease, improving education, fighting poverty and homelessness. And I guess what I'd say is maybe generally just fixing what's broken in the world. Yeah. So 2008, one cause, I guess it was BidPal at the time, um, yeah. was first to market with a mobile bidding or with mobile bidding for fundraising. Why was that the pain the company focused on uh, at that time versus online giving, event management, and the other solutions that you've added to your portfolio? It's it's an important question. I, and remember, I wasn't the founder of the company. I, right. I joined the company in 2014 as the CEO. But I do know that there was a, a real particular inefficiency in that particular segment of fundraising. And if, if you've ever participated in a silent auction and used paper bid sheets, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And you can see how fundraising is not maximized. And you can see that the value proposition to come to a nonprofit and say, hey, we can take that paper, that really kind of paper-based fundraising effort and digitize that and use a mobile device to help you streamline that. You can see where there's true value. And what happens with the paper bid sheets is you put in a bid, you walk away, you enjoy your evening. You might even forget. You know, there are some people who like guard the bid sheets. And that's actually the experience that the founders of the company went through as well. They attended a fundraising gala. They had hopes to really support the gala. And they walked away. They went to the bar. They had some dinner. They had some fun. And so, you know, compare that or contrast that to now you're at event, an event. You're getting text messages throughout the evening that you've been outbid. You're getting notifications and alerts from the organization that uh, certain, you know, when the items are closing or if there's no items to bid. So you can really see how fundraising multiplies and, and it really lends itself to, to digital fundraising, mobile technology, so much more so than online fundraising. And so, and the market is huge, Roger, and it's still growing. And again, what we found out during the pandemic is everything that we've been doing in person can also be done with a virtual extension as well. And so I think, again, that extends the reach of the, the fundraising effort and really extends and improves the yield uh, on a per event basis. So it's not just the three or 400 people who are attending in person, it's the thousands of people who can attend also just using their, their uh, portable, uh, their mobile device to, to bid. Yep. Absolutely. And we'll talk more about that later, that, that pivot. But what I find interesting about nonprofit or, or giving tech companies is just how many of them are based here in central Indiana. So we got One Cause, Onboard, uh, Bloomerang, Givelify, even Blackbaud has a location here. And then there's Boardable, where you happen to be uh, on the board uh, for that company. What is it about Indiana that's, that's fostered so many of these companies? And do you see uh, much knowledge, share, or talent between the organizations? You know, I think what you've just described is something of the basic building blocks for, let's call it an ecosystem in Indianapolis and maybe extended to the central Indiana region. So so an ecosystem, you first, you need people, right? And so you mentioned a couple of companies that somebody like Jay Love is involved with. And so Jay Love was a trailblazer and he started eTapestry, which was sold to Blackbot. And that's they stayed here as Blackbot. And so that's why you see um, the Blackbaud name in and around Indianapolis. And then then what Jay did is he reinvested his experience and his capital and started Bloomerang. And now that's grown to over 200 employees. And and I think I think not coincidentally, he sold eTapestry to Blackbaud in 2007. And that's right about the time that the founders of BidPal were coming together 
which was the predecessor company to One Cause. And maybe that gave them the confidence that there was a market out there or there was a potential and, and for capital. And, and there was. And so capital is that, that other kind of aspect that you need for an ecosystem. And now we have grown. The company that was started back in 2008 is BidPal. Now we're about, we're over 250 strong across the country with 150 plus here in Indy. And then I would say you need infrastructure and culture to, to also facilitate and support an ecosystem. And you've got the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy at IU here. You can actually get an undergraduate degree in philanthropic studies, which I think is fantastic. And it's probably unique uh, in the country. And then ultimately, you know, I'm a Chicago guy. I came, I came down to Indianapolis from Chicago. But one of the things that my wife and I both noticed when we came down here is that people truly care. And I think that's also rooted in Indianapolis culture. And so whether it's faith-based like Givelify or whether it's cause or community-based like Onboard and Boardable and One Cause, I'd say people, people here want to do, want to do, they want to do good. They want to make a positive impact. And, you know, of course we want to, we want to do financial, we want to do well financially as well, but I don't think that that has to be mutually exclusive, right? You, but you don't find that in every city that also has a vibrant tech community. I think the second part of your question was what kind of like uh, knowledge sharing is going on. I would say that, you know, guys like Jay and Jeb Banner, who was one of the founders of Boardable, they were the first to welcome me to Indy. When I first moved sh from Chicago, we had lunch, we hung out, we shared stories. And then later, we actually maybe solidified that more. And we met, uh, we talked about best practices for human resources, a little CEO group running companies that had nonprofits as customers and, and, and little hint, it's different than supporting commercial organizations. And so we shared best practices and, you know, I would say that, you know, the pandemic put a stop to that, but it was um, really good to, to kind of get together as a little CEO support group uh, yeah. for, uh, you know, leaders who are running uh, companies that had nonprofits as customers. Yeah. Well, I mean, just being a CEO can be a lonely job. Not that I've ever done it, but I've talked to a lot of yeah. CEOs. So being able to talk to another CEO where you kind of let your guard down is, is a, certainly a, a great advantage. But then to have the added bonus to be able to talk to CEOs that, that not only understand the role of CEO, but your, your space, that has to be a great uh, advantage. It's a, it's a great thing. And you have to, to your point, you have also have to create the safe space where you can come together and you can share best practices and you're, you're kind of competing a little bit, but really, you know, I, you, if you believe in an abundance mentality versus a scarcity mentality, you can come and say, there's enough success for all of the, for all of us. Let's just work together and let's share our best practices and let's help each other be successful. Cause you're right. You know, we as CEOs, we're often expected to have all the answers. And, you know, again, we oftentimes don't. And that's, again, fundamentally uh, what's behind a lot of the, the vulnerability that, that I write about and the vulnerability that I hopefully show um, in the book, Fearless. Yeah. And that, uh, that spirit of collaboration among, among individuals, among organizations, among companies is a theme that I just see over and over again in Indiana, and I've been here all my life, uh, and I've been involved in tech for quite some time, mm -hmm. that I think is really one of our advantages. So I was glad that you were able to, to take advantage of that. Um, so you mentioned this earlier, you were not the original founder of One Cause, which was then called BidPal at the time. Uh, you previously founded or had been involved with several successful companies, many of them in the, in the music industry. Um, what was it about the opportunity at One Cause that, that motivated this shift in your career? So, so the first part of my career was pretty corporate. And that was, that was about 15 years. I worked at PricewaterhouseCoopers. I actually worked for the Coopers side of that, Coopers and Librand, and then at Gateway. And, and Gateway was probably a Fortune 100 company at the time. And when I say Gateway, maybe there's younger listeners out there who don't remember who Gateway is, but yeah. it's a computer company with a cow spotted boxes yep. uh, at that gateway. Yep. Exactly. I think we all kind of had our first taste of technology. And so yep. what, what gateway really introduced me to Roger was this intersection of, and I, and I say, it's the intersection of technology and fill in the blank. And we were, we were working at the intersection of technology and home entertainment and home productivity, technology and music and technology and education. 
And then in the meantime, I ran an early stage venture accelerator for about eight years. And we invested and started up 19 companies during that time. And they were working on a lot of really important uh, and really important discoveries. And like you said, I started two technology-based music companies, managing, I managed a band, I ran a production company. And as I look back at that, I thought, man, what was I thinking? I, that is very an eclectic background. Yeah. So, sure. so fast forward through all of that, you know, joining what was called BidPal at the time. It came at a time in my career when I was seeking, I'm going to say, more joy or fulfillment in my career. I had come, it, it came right when, when I had turned 50, I almost said 40. <laughs> I had just turned 50. My kids who were my original why or my reason for doing what I was doing were now out of the house. They didn't need me anymore. They were successful and I was searching and I didn't know what for. And as, as my story goes, my why story goes, I was reading this Wired Magazine article with Bill Ga Gates and, Cl and Bill Clinton on the cover. And they were telling the story of using their wealth and power and influence from their first careers to do good and their second careers. And I was literally, I was on the beach with my wife and I literally, I turned to her and said, that's it. That's what I'm missing. I need purpose in my career. I need bigger mission or a reason. I need a bigger why. And so, you know, when you decide what it is that you want or you need, when it comes across the radar, then you're able to identify it. And one cause came across my radar about six months later. And in that moment, I knew that that was what I wanted, that that's what I was, I was looking for. And so I look at like one cause is the continuation of this intersection between technology and you, you used, um, I like your terminology of giving tech earlier. I call it like technology and generosity. So we, we trademarked technology for good a few years ago. So it's about helping nonprofits, thousands of nonprofits raise over a billion dollars a year for their causes. And like, when I look at that at the end of the day, I don't think it gets any better than that. I think it's like, if you had a superpower and you said, I'm, how am I going to use my superpower for good? I think that's a perfect, one cause is a perfect example of that. And I couldn't be happier to be uh, where I am today after that eclectic background. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, so you were involved with a lot of different companies um, uh, and you mentioned some of them specifically, but what what about these experiences? Um, what, what from these experiences have informed the success that you've had at one cause? And then what are some of the leadership lessons that you've learned over the years? And I'm sure that'll be kind of a segue into your book, but but tell me about a little bit about some of those leadership lessons you've learned over the years. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I, I guess what I would say is I have had the outstanding fortune of having really quality mentorship along my journey. And two mentors really stand out to me. First of all is Rick Snyder. Rick, I, I, I met him early in my career. He started as my boss. He became my venture partner. He's now a friend. And what I learned from Rick was this deep, thoughtful, intellectual decision-making based on research and analysis and lots of Excel spreadsheets. And that was kind of, that was kind of his specialty. And then from Ted Waite, who was the founder of Gateway, who's a true visionary and friend, I learned things like instinct and going with your gut and maybe doing a little bit of gunslinging along the way, just really two opposite spectrums of, of going at it. And I've taken those learnings and I've paid them forward and I've been a mentor to young entrepreneurs. And so what I'd say is, hey, you young up and comers, find a mentor if you don't already have one. And old timers like me, um, find someone, uh, take them under your wing, help them along their journey. Um, they've got a lot of energy. You've got a lot of knowledge. Put those things together and see what you can do. I've worked with a lot of big companies and small companies, and I'd say the other thing from a leadership lesson, lesson standpoint is, man, you got to allow for change. And who I was 20 years ago is not who I am today as a leader. And in order to have done what, what I was able to do together with the company and the leadership of the company and, and getting through the global pandemic was, was, let's say, this version of me, I'm more contemplative. I'm more thoughtful. I'm more mindful. I'm a little bit more patient. My wife might disagree, but that's not who I was 20 years ago. But I needed Steve, today's version of Steve, uh, to be the leader um, at who you see show up in one uh, in, in Fearless. Yeah. So speaking of leadership lessons, uh, 
you recently published your first book, uh, Fearless Leadership Lessons at the Crossroads. And of course, I'm wearing your shirt even too uh, today. Nice. Um, I appreciate that. Thanks for giving it to me. But uh, what what made you decide to write a book and, and what does it mean to be a fearless leader? First of all, I appreciate you calling it my first book. It is truly my first book. I don't think I'll probably write a second book, but you never, never, you never know. <laughs> you may go through another so pandemic I'm, and you may have to start writing I, another book, but hopefully not. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what I guess I, I'm calling myself the accidental author. And what I mean by that is I didn't sit down to write a book. Um, I sat down to write an update to my company. And, and you know, we were at the beginning of the COVID journey. We had made some pretty substantial changes to the to the economics of the business to give us more run re- runway and to take care of ourselves, put our mask on first before helping uh, our others, which were our customers. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to communicate how we were doing on our way back. And what I said to the company is we're not going to be able to measure this on the calendar. We, it, there, it, there's so many unknowns out there that I can't say in September, everything is going to be fine and we're going to go back to the way it used to be. And so I said the only way that we were going to measure that is by measuring our performance. And the only way that we're going to be able to measure our performance is if I tell you how we're doing. And so I made that commitment to be weekly. And so I started sending weekly letters to one, one cause. And, and they started out just by being kind of check-ins, like, how are you doing? Um, and sharing how we're doing. But I started to draw inspiration. I developed a little bit of a theme by drawing inspiration from, oh, we were all watching streaming services back then, right? We were watching Netflix and, and I was listening to my mindfulness app and I was reading about stoicism and, and, and cu- how customers were, were fundraising in the, in the midst of all this chaos. And so I started to just kind of create themes and then apply those themes to how we can learn different leader, uh, leadership lessons or le- le- lessons. And I would say these these updates became something of this connective tissue. We we were a company that was maybe 200 strong at the time, and we all in an instant went to work from home. And how do you create culture? And how do you keep everyone connected? And it became this connective tissue that people look forward to. And that found that formed the foundation for the book. So that really came over, together over two and a half years. And in 2022, we wrote the introductions to the chapters. We pulled out the leadership lessons that are summarized at the end of each chapter, and we organized the updates into themes. So it isn't a true chronology of events through the pandemic, but it's themes that are grouped together. um, And, and, you know, again, we hope that that tells a story around themes rather than uh, just the, the, the calendar. And, you know, again, I think you asked, what does it mean to be fearless or fearless leadership? And so... I think it starts with authenticity. I think authenticity is about acting in alignment with your beliefs. And that's why I kind of, um, you know, kind of lean towards the Stoics as well as like you're doing the right thing um, and acting in accordance with your values and making sure that your values and your beliefs are also aligned with your company. And if they're not, um, making sure that you get that kind of alignment. And a big part of my authenticity, Roger, is being vulnerable. And I would say, again, almost a paradox, like people think of vulnerability maybe as a weakness. And what I'll say is it comes from a position of strength because you have to be, you have to, you have to have the strength to, to admit that you don't have all the answers and, and you, you know, being willing and then being fearless is being willing to move forward in the, in the, in the knowledge that you don't have all the answers and, and, and with in the face of such great uncertainty and, and great unknown. And so, and again, I can't think of a period in time of my life or my career where there was so, so much uncertainty. So that's about being authentic, being vulnerable, being fearless and moving forward. And it's ultimately about being a leader. And what I say too, is everyone at one cause and everyone has the capacity for leadership. One of my favorite definitions of leadership is, uh, leadership is not, it is about inspiring others to lead. And so that's how I was measuring my effectiveness as a leader as well as how effective was I being at inspiring others to lead. And so I was leading, but I was also watching others lead. And I would say that's ultimately um, what what the the um, updates helped uh, keep going and how we were ultimately measuring success 
by uh, inspiring others to lead? I know that's a long answer to your question, but no, that's okay. I saw we're here. Um, so the focal point of, of the book was uh, leading one cause, the one cause team through pivoting, right? During, during the pandemic. With so many companies that were hit hard during that time and having to let people go, one cause didn't experience any layoffs. Any layoffs. Um, talk about that moment for one cause and, and what you were able to do. As I think about that, that was probably the toughest situation that, that we were in. Like, like most SaaS companies, the largest expense that we have is payroll. And so that would be kind of the first place that you would look. But we also found that we needed all hands on deck for this. We, we literally reached out to every single customer who had an event coming up in next week, then the next month, then the next couple of quarters. And so we needed everyone to really, you know, help, help. And we, we emailed our customers just to really help them manage through that process. And then also we, we found that our new business was picking up. Our, our, the interest in a product was picking up. Our, our leads and opportunities in, in lead creation was picking up because nonprofits who to this point in time had said no to digital transformation were now seeking digital transformation because that became almost their only source of really reaching folks now. Uh, in this world where you couldn't bring them together. And so um, we, we saw a, an in, increased need for sales and sales development and, and marketing. And then finally, you know, we made a decision to really, I would say, double down on product development. And we squeezed a year and a half to two years of development into four months. And we created a purpose-built virtual fundraising solution that we decided to build let's say in late March, and we launched in September of that year. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we just, we needed to keep our team together. We needed to stay assembled. And so, and we also knew that a reduction in force or a riff would be a morale buster. So we made other decisions. We made decisions to keep people around. Um, we reduced our operating expenses in whatever way that we could, including moving out of our corporate headquarters. And we didn't know when we would see our way through to the other side, but we knew that we had to keep going. We had to keep together. Um, and it wasn't just for the sake of one cause, Roger. It was for the sake of the thousands of nonprofits who are counting on us. Um, the stakes were super high. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a quote that I had to write down because I didn't want to get it wrong. But there's, it's a former fo Formula One racer. And he said, you can't overtake 15 cars on a sunny day but you can when it's raining. And so that's what we looked at. We, we leaned in and we went for it. I think the pavement was pretty wet, uh, but we decided we got to go for it. We got to lean in and, and, and um, it ultimately paid off. Yeah. Great quote. Great analogy. Um, you know, I, I gotta, I gotta say the, the, the pivot that you mentioned the, that you had, you had to build this whole new uh, a piece of software for, so that you could, you could, um, better serve your customers. Um, it's mentioned, I know, in chapter 11 of the book, um, and, and there's a nice shout out to TechPoint there as well, because after you went through all of that, you, uh, you were able to present to TechPoint because we created this brand new category, kind of a, I think maybe a one-time category at the Mirror Awards called the uh, pandemic, pandemic Pivot. Um, and you got to, you were you you are nominated for uh, for that particular category, and you were able to present, and you're able to win. Um, talk to me a little bit about that, and, and and what that was like. Yeah, so I sure hope that it is a one time uh, award, right. and for, for all of our takes, yeah. uh, you know, one and done. Let's say, but it, it was a great opportunity for us because you know, uh, again, uh, Tech Point and through the Mira Awards, generally, you know, really recognizes growth and, and, you know, the ability to kind of um, grow and scale your businesses. But we weren't in a situation where that was really relevant. We were in a situation where we had to do everything that we, we, we possibly could within our power to keep our customers fundraising, to keep, um, uh, or, uh, to keep revenue coming into the company, um, and to keep moving forward in this period of uh, massive uncertainty um, and massive change. And so it was a great opportunity for us to tell a story. For us to tell a story, and, and I don't, I, some people don't like to use the word pivot, but I, I am fine with it because it was a massive pivot where we had 2,100 events that were scheduled for spring in-person fundraising, and those went to zero overnight, literally overnight. 
And it took everything that we could to, to change the way that we went to market, to change the way our customers fund, uh, r- raise funds, uh, to be able to go from in-person fundraising to virtual and online, absolutely within tw- a 24-hour period, and to keep fundraising. And again, it was, it was an honor to be recognized for that. And it was an honor to be able to tell our story of how we were able to, to, to move through that. Incidentally, though, the, the, the pandemic pivot of the year came in 2021, and we were still in the middle of the pandemic. If you look at 2021, we actually had three variants of the pandemic, and so we were still in it. So I think I probably said, this is a story that's still being written. This isn't, I can't say that we've gotten through it. And so it was just kind of taking a moment in time and saying how we've been able to, to manage the company through this time, but we're not done yet. And the journey continues and the story continues. Yeah. One of the things uh, about the book, and if if you're listening, you can't you can't see it. But if you're if you're watching, you can see that the cover of the book has a lotus flower on it. And there's there's a story uh, that has to do with all the muck and everything that's underneath that. Um, Tell me a little bit about that image and and the significant the significance of of the lotus and as 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 it uh, pertains to fearless. I'm delighted to tell that story. And you can see it's bringing a big smile to my face. It, it's really the story that formed the basis for my future updates and, you know, seeking inspiration from, from, from outside and, and sharing that with One Cause Nation and retelling that story. And so there's an ancient Buddhist parable about this lotus bud that works its way through the muck and the mud of the pond. And it ultimately makes its way to the surface as it emerges as this beautiful lotus flower. And so the bud is a symbol of potential and the flower is a symbol of transformation and rebirth and you know kind of the the parable or the 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 moral of the story is without the journey through the mud you don't get the lotus and so it's like no mud no lotus and you know i, I was listening to my daily call meditation app and when i heard that story i thought that is us but we are not the lotus flower yet. We are the bud in the mud. We are working our way through the mud. And our nonprofit customers were in the same spot. And so, you know, I, I said to myself, that is a story that I have to tell or retell to the team because we are all feeling the darkness of this mud. But we also have to all collectively have the vision of where we can be someday, where we will be that beautiful lotus flower that it will emerge someday. And, you know, again, as a, as, a, as a personal story, I live very close to the Japanese garden um, in, in Carmel, and we would go to the Japanese garden and seek some solace and some quiet and some peace. And, and, and in a time, that was really um, important to me. And so all of, those, all of those images connected for me. And then the marketing t- team took the imagery and created that beautiful book cover, the symbolism throughout the book. It's visually stunning. It's so meaningful to us and to our shared customers. And so I will also say that as I look at One Cause today, and as I look at the fundraising landscape today, I will say that we have emerged as that beautiful lotus flower, that we have realized the, the, the reemergence um, and the rebirth that that lotus flower promised. And so um, it is a journey that we started in the mud three years ago. And finally now, three years later, we have emerged as this beautiful lotus flower. Yeah. And it's really not, it's really not just you, but it's, again, it's all the companies, all the organizations that you serve as well, right? You, they went through that period of, of being in the mud and now they have the opportunity to, to be above their head above water, right? Literally. And to be able to experience right. the sunshine and to participate in, in all the things that you do for them. So. Yeah. And Roger, I haven't come up with the right analogy to now that we are this beautiful lotus lotus flower that's now sitting on the, on the pond, but it must be all of the other attacks that it then goes, go that, that, that are, are made against it because we emerged from the pandemic only to go into the, the, I guess out of the frying pan and into the fire of um, inflationary pressures, rising interest rates, declining stock markets, tech layoffs, fears of recession, you know, it is, it is, if it's not one thing, it's the other. So we have moved, I believe, out of the pandemic. We are the, the lotus flower, but it's, we're, life is not without its challenges. Absolutely. So 
the book is is uh, full of leadership lessons. Is there a favorite that you have? One that stands out. You know, I think when I think about that, uh, when you just said that, it's like picking a favorite child, right? And so uh, there's a ton of uh, there's over fifty leadership lessons in there. So what I'll say is, I do have a favorite chapter, and that chapter is chapter fifteen, and it's called connection, and it's about human connection. Is so. The reason I call it out is when I look back on the pandemic and what it took away from us, almost uniquely to the pandemic, it took away our ability to connect with other people, as people, in person. And in fact, what it taught us and what we taught our children during that time was to actually avoid human contact. When we were out walking, we would say, looks like there are some people coming down the sidewalk, what we probably should do is move to the other side of the street and walk down the other side of the sidewalk. And, and I just feel, I felt sad about that. And I, and I felt, and I, so I wrote about it. And I wrote about um, the human connection that starts with your family and, 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 and families were separated. And I talked about our, your direct family and I talked about mine and I talked about the extended family. And I, and, I, and I really truly believe, I'm one of those who believes that a company is an extension of your family. I say, welcome to the One Cause family. Right. And, and I talk about that as, as a family. And I, I know that there's others that I actually have called out in the book. They said, they don't really believe in that, but I do. And, and, I, and if you leave One Cause, I said, you will always have a place to call home. And I believe that. And I also believe in connection as friendship. And I talk about reaching out to friends and reconnecting with friends and being the one who connects because people out there need you and they need to make connection. And finally, I talked, we faced death. Um, and I talked about celebrating life. Um, and I talked about taking the time to do that. So I want people to, now that we have a chance, nurture human connection, build community, uh, establish and strengthen your culture. Um, and, you know, I just, I just think about one of the, one of the things we lost during the 2020, 21 period was this human connection. So I just want to encourage everybody to reestablish that human connection and seek out people that you disconnected with, um, through the pandemic. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, Steve, as we close, I want to take the time to highlight the year that you're having so far at one cause you announced in January that you had a milestone of 5 billion raised since the company was founded and you launched, uh, a few new features for your fundraising platform. As you look to the next few years, what do you see on the horizon for uh, for One Cause Nation? Right? Is that what, I think that's what you call it in the yes, in the book. yes. So, so as we hit that five billion in funds raised since inception number, we also crossed another milestone, which was an annual basis. And in 2022 alone, we helped raise over 1.1 billion dollars. And so, as we look to the future, we're, we're gonna we expect that to grow even more each year. So. We have now, so I expect that five to increase every year by at least another billion dollars as we move uh, forward. And so it is really monumental. It is remarkable. Again, considering how this conversation started with where we were in facing literally an existential threat in the pandemic. And now three years later, being able to cross that billion dollar fundraising mark, it is a, a really fantastic milestone. And I'm really proud of the company and I'm really proud of the thousands of nonprofits that we've helped support. Then as we look to the future, yes, we released our new One Cause fundraising platform, which I call the future of fundraising, that we're calling the future of fundraising. It's modern, it's more consumer-like. And you know, too often the nonprofit sector has been, I would say has had to compromise on technology and innovation, really trailing the commercial world. And, and you know, I would say we're here to say, that doesn't have to be the way that we want to help lead digital innovation and ease of use and seamless experiences into the nonprofit ecosystem uh, uh, as well. So it's it's taking a broad base of so-called point solutions and uh, providing a fully integrated offering. So, yeah, I think that you know we we've we've made our way through the worst of the pandemic. As we mentioned earlier, we we're, we're, we have these other issues like global conflict and, and stock market declines and, and, and tech job cuts. And I don't know, I'm not an economist, whether there's going to be a recession or not, but I can also tell you that the nonprofit world, the giving world has been recession resistant, giving plateaus, maybe di uh, dips a little bit, but is followed by years of, of, of nice growth afterwards. And so 
Um, as I tell my team though, you know, if we've made it through COVID, if we made it through all of the challenges that were uh, thrown uh, at us, if we have shown the resilience that we've shown against the adversity that has been uh, put forth against us, I think that we've proven that there's really nothing that we can't do. So I say, bring it on. Uh, and here we go. Steve, I appreciate your time. You have been um, a fearless um, supporter of the Indiana digital innovation economy. Um, it, it's definitely appreciated. And it's not just us at TechPoint that, that feel that love. But I think so many uh, organizations feel that as well. I um, want to wish you the, the, the best of luck as you continue. Uh, and it's, it'll just be exciting to see where, where one cause goes o over the next few years. And uh, just to see the impact that you're making, not only on, on, the, on the, the tech ecosystem, but on, again, all of those other organizations and, and, and um, uh, companies that, that you serve through, through the work that you do. Thanks, Roger. And, and if I may, I will say, again, thank you back to TechPoint and, and all that TechPoint does and, and will continue to do. We see ourselves as an Indianapolis success story. I think that young startups can look at us and say, there's a company that was started in Indianapolis in 2008. Uh, we've been around for a long time and we have shown that you can grow and scale a business in Indianapolis, a tech business in Indianapolis without having to go to the coast, without having to really sacrifice anything. We have grown, we love it here. Um, and we have been able to grow and scale and uh, fill tech talent, fill marketing, sales, really all aspects of our business here in Indianapolis. So again, I thank you and TechPoint for all the work that you do. Uh, and I thank the community for being supportive of me personally. As I came down from Chicago in 2014, I found myself welcomed. I found uh, a great environment here to um, thrive um, and, and grow a business. So again, thanks for having me today. And uh, thanks to TechPoint for all you do. Thanks, Steve.